rats. All we do is take, Dad. I'm tired Pups. of taking. But rats are also useful for aging research and for cooking ratatouille. But in all seriousness, take a look at this recent headline article. We have the oldest living female Sprague Dawley rat, said Dr. Harold Ketcher, a former biology professor at the University of Maryland, now chief scientific officer at UVAN Research, a California-based startup. So rejuvenation and rats, that's what we're talking about today. And how this rat has apparently become the longest living rat for its species following concentrated plasma injections taken from young rats. And what this could mean for human therapeutics, along with my perspectives. But before we get there, we must go back, back to the late 1950s and early 1960s, to a time when the Shiki Science Show didn't even exist, but when researchers such as Clive McKay did, and these researchers were conducting a procedure called heterochronic parabiosis. Simply surgically joining two animals together such that they share a circulatory system. Sounds a bit grim. <laughs> shocking, perhaps. Even wine-spittingly shocking. But it provided an experimental system to test the systemic effects on ageing in different tissues, since the circulatory system irrigates the body. The hetero here refers to mixed, different, whereas chronic here means age. So the lifespan was measured in both homochronic and heterochronic pairs. So if using old with olds or young with young, or old with young respectively. This early work first suggested it could beneficially influence the older rat and that exposure to a young systemic environment was beneficial. A landmark paper in 2005 by the Comboy Lab confirmed these early results, showing it ameliorated ageing phenotypes. But the question remains, was the effect due to the presence of rejuvenating factors in the young blood, or was it due to a dilution effect of pro-ageing factors in the old blood? Okay, so let's rewind further back. What even is in blood full stop? Well, firstly, there's the red blood cells that carry oxygen around the body. And then we have the white blood cells and platelets responding to wounds and infections, very important. And then we have the plasma, the soluble fraction of blood that contains water, ions, proteins, mainly albumin, but also some inflammatory and growth factors, nutrients, gases, hormones. Yeah, our blood carries a lot. And so you can think of blood as a transport and communication channel. And so in a previous video, I covered follow-up work by the Comboys that proved dilution of pro-aging factors could be an explanation for the beneficial effects seen in heterochronic parabiosis. Here they performed plasma exchange. So this involved separating out blood so that you spin down and keep the blood cells, but they replaced the plasma, the parts containing the proteins, with a solution of physiological saline and albumin. And they found that this replacement alone was sufficient to get rejuvenation in three germ tissue layers. But while it provides evidence that aging was caused by pro-aging factors that were eliminated, it didn't rule out the fact that there could have been anti-aging slash rejuvenating factors in the young bloods. And I'm just gonna point out now that I'm really not a big fan of using this dichotomy in terms of talking about factors in the plasma, but for simplicity, I will stick with them for now. And that's because there is still evidence from this side of these anti-aging factors. A 2014 paper showed that young blood refers to age-related impairments in cognitive function and synaptic plasticity in mice. So as part of the paper, they took just the young blood plasma and administered it to aged mice and saw it improved hippocampal-dependent learning. Anyhow, this brings us back to this man here, Dr. Harold Katcher who on coming across some of this early work on heterochronic parabiosis in his search for a human rejuvenation therapy, as he describes in his book, The Illusion of Knowledge, the solution became clear. Cellular aging did not depend on the cell's history, but on its environment. Bodily aging was not the result of cellular aging, rather cellular aging was caused by bodily aging. And he sought out to further test this theory. Kircher was a supporter of the presence of there being factors in young bloods that have rejuvenating potential. And so he was like, You with me? So let's do this thing! But having an idea is just the beginning. He needed to test it. And to cut a long story short, which he describes most of the events in his book, he ended up working with researchers in Mumbai, India, 
where they began injecting something called E5 into the tail veins of rats. The quick summary is that he wanted to do heterochronic plasma exchange, but without the expertise equipment to do so, they instead took the plasma from the young rats, fractionated it and concentrated it. And they called it E5. E, I'm guessing for Alexa, E5 because, well, E's the fifth letter of the alphabet, or because 789, who knows? But let's discuss in more detail what they did in these tests. Let's start with the rats. The rats they were using were Spragdoli rats, an outbred breed of albino rats used extensively in medical research. The main advantage they possess are their calmness and ease of handling, with a typical lifespan of 2.5 to 3.5 years. And the procedure is as follows. The rats, beginning at around two years old, were injected four times with E5 over eight days, so that's dose one, and then they had a second dose given on day 95. And this figure is summarising what I just said, and also some of the tests that they did. The rats were either given E5 or saline infusions as a control. And the results of these tests can be found mostly in Harold's book, but also in this preprint article, which in case you don't know what that means, it means it hasn't been through peer review, but it has got the figures and colour and is free for anyone to access. So just bear that at the back of your mind. So one marker that they examined in these mice that were treated was grip strength. This video shows how they did it. And take a close look. The first rat was an untreated old rat, while the second was given E5. Now you don't want to know how many times I rewatched parts of this video, but it does, even by eye, seem like the treated rats are showing more resistance to the manual pulling by the handler. But the fully quantified data released so far can be seen here. And so it seems like the treated rat had an improved grip strength. But this is just one measure, and Katcher continues to break down in his book other results collected that are also seen in this preprint. Other markers they looked at include the levels of interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, both protein factors linked with senescence and inflammation. The orange bar shows the treated old mice, and it shows a decline on treatment that increases again before declining again following the second dose of E5. Katcher remarks in his book how following the second dose, the inevitable rise seems to be slower than the following, than following the first dose, which seems compelling. Cognition. Given previous papers, the researchers were interested to see how cognitive function was altered since the decline in cognitive function is seen with age. They tested learning and memory with the Barnes maze test. Essentially, this involves timing how long it takes for the rats to escape. So with time, the latency declines, and with the young plotted in blue being the fastest. And while it is clear here that E5 is having an impact on these tests, it's also quite interesting to note the initial lag of the impact following the first treatment. This could potentially inform on the molecular events that must happen in the brain, but who really knows at this point? <laughs> and so to go along with these clinical and molecular biomarkers of ageing, they also looked at DNA methylation. This is used as a proxy for biological age, as sets of DNA methylation marks are seen to change with age. And so Katcher worked with Steve Horvath, who pioneered this field, on this step and was able to develop one of these epigenetic ageing clocks that worked for predicting both human and rat ageing, a so-called dual species clock. And it is shown here that this E5 injection more than halved the epigenetic ages of blood, heart and liver tissue, and it had a less pronounced but statistically significant rejuvenation effect observed in the hypothalamus, so a region of the brain. And the authors comment that the rejuvenation of non-blood organs from this intravenous treatment, coupled with reversal of the epigenetic clock within these organs, supports the notion that ageing can be systemically controlled, at least in part through the circulatory system with plasma as the medium. And it's also worth me mentioning here that the fact that there is a reduction in this human rat pan tissue clock suggests that there is some conservation of the ageing process across the species and that if it worked with the rats, then potentially there's a good chance the same could happen for humans. But we'll come back to that at the end in the discussion. And we could also just disregard this evidence completely as there is still no agreement over whether a reduction in epigenetic age is biologically meaningful, but in combination with the other results I've shown, it does become quite compelling. Which brings us back to the recent news articles. Seema, the 47-month-old rat, almost four years old now, covering the headlines. 
she is a female rat, which is also interesting because it is mentioned in the book and Harold has mentioned in online interviews that they tend to see a greater improvement in the male rats than the females. In the grub strength video I showed earlier, they were female rats. But as Katja says... It wasn't working as well in our initial test. It was working. We definitely saw a difference. But... My, my own thinking, which may be totally wrong, of course, is that uh, the ovary plays an important part in, in female aging. But again, without more data coming out, I can't really say much more. Indeed, the results from Catcher's latest study will only be written when Seema dies, which is hopefully when we can also find out what this mysterious E5 plasma actually consists of. As the book also doesn't give much away, and this is partly due to patents, and this also explains why it's not been published, because top journals can't publish work until they reveal what E5 is, as without knowing what E5 is, other scientists can't repeat the findings, and they clearly want to be able to commercialise it. So, yes, there's that. And then depending on the source, there will be ethical issues. According to their patent, I put the link in the description, they list potential protein components, but there could also be RNA DNA present and other metabolites. And to be fair, really little is detailed at the moment for the reasons I just explained. And while most commonly pigs are mentioned as the source, it also states here that other mammals such as cows, sheep, and even humans could also be used. And so irrespective, there's gonna be some ethical concerns for some people. An alternative, would be to just work out which of the components in E5 is beneficial and just deliver those and, manifest, and manufacture them artificially. This could also potentially improve safety over immune reactions, though apparently they haven't observed any so far. But that said, they do list potential protein components, which includes complement C3, which I know is part of the innate immune response. So go figure, I don't know. And those of you paying close attention will have realised I never defined what I meant by rejuvenation here. But general loose definition is a procedure that reverses age, as opposed to slowing it down, the latter being jury protective. With the limited data so far, some of the graphs suggest that this is a rejuvenation procedure, but again, more of the data is needed. Which brings me to my third point, which is how reproducible is it? Again, without the peer review publication, it's hard to know. But Steve Horvath is quoted to say in this Guardian article that some people will criticise the results due to their low sample size. <coughs> not me. One swallow does not make a summer. But I believe the results because several complementary studies support them. He anticipates safe and effective treatments will emerge from the plasma research in the next 20 years. And this is backed up by Catcher himself. In a recent interview, he had this to say. Yeah, no, no. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll... Within a, a year or two, we'll be able to extend the lifespan and youth span in, in humans. I plan to be one of the first volunteers. <laughs> Though I would like to definitely see more numbers tested and to have some clarity over how standardized this E5 treatment is and more functional tests. But given the systemic nature of the circulatory system and the other studies I mentioned at the start of the video, Along with this being a minimally invasive procedure, for sure makes this a feasible treatment strategy. I feel like so far, as his book title suggests, Katcher has given us the illusion of knowledge that this procedure is working, but I'm sure all will become very clear when the data comes out, when it's gone through peer review. All we have to do for now is see how long Seema lives, wait for the paper to come out to show what E5 is, and to watch this video here. <laughs> And as a quick plug as well, um, I will be presenting at this upcoming Curing Aging conference, and I'll put a link to it below. With that, thank you to my Patreon supporters, and catch you later.